Okay, so we're going to start this. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Now everybody knows he's the smart one. No. <laughs> he's the guy that does all the hands-on. He's, he's done it. I just read about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, good morning. First good seminar morning. of the year. We have one every second Saturday of every month up to uh, through October. I was thinking September was our last no. one, but October is our last one. That's what so we have morning, these for. Everybody. Good to see you again. That's why we have these. See, they list that on here. So grab one. The first year, or our first one is RV accessories. Every other one from then on out, if you, if you take one of the RV seminar schedules here, you'll see we do the 101. The 101 is our one where we get pretty in depth with a lot of stuff. So, like I say, today's accessories, we're going to go every, over everything. Over the years, we've found work. Uh, there's a couple things on this table that are relatively new. We're just going to show you them, let you know they are out there if you want them. Uh, my name is David Taylor. This is Big Dan Edgecombe. We've worked together quite a while. Between the two of us, we've got about 70 years RV experience, service, teching, selling. We've done it all. Yep. Uh, and a lot of it not really well, but this we seem to pull off pretty good. So 70 years between us, and I've been doing it two years, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying how old Dan is. His, his can't math's talk not about so that. good. <laughs> so, so feel free at any time to answer, ask questions. Um, you can see we're going to kind of go right down the list there. We'll ask you, if we get to something really nobody wants to talk about, we we'll say, or we'll even ask you. Because there's nothing worse than telling you about something you don't want to hear today. So thanks for coming. There's lots of goodies in back. Feel free to eat them up. Whatever's uh, left over, all these employees around here are going to get to eat. So he does most of the solar panels, Wi-Fi's. He's really up on that. I'm one of those guys that just got rid of my flip phone about a year ago. So I don't discuss that kind of stuff. Well, that's a company. So, I'm all into the other stuff. He's techie. So, we're going to let him start with batteries and roll right on through. And like I say, if you have questions, ask. We're here for you. Well, thank you for that. Um, again, this is a question-driven seminar. And uh, the guy back there trying to get seven pieces of pastry on a four pastry uh, plate. Uh, he doesn't count because he's been here like every one for like five years. So anyway, um, if if you want to know about batteries, now is the time to uh, pay attention. And I thank you for showing up. Last fall, we we were really getting into these, uh, and we now stock them. These are the lithium ion batteries. Uh, we've been playing with them for years, a few years, but. They've been so expensive that uh, we weren't that interested in them. Lithium ion has a couple of benefits. And uh, we really, we saw this. Uh, we did a big solar inverter uh, battery uh, installation on a Pantana, which is a Numar, now, I don't want to use the word entry level, but it's Numar's lower level diesel pusher, but they're they're an extremely nice coach. Uh, we put uh, quite a bit of solar on them. We did uh, an upgrade on the batteries. And, and this, the guy was uh, really pretty sharp about it. He did a lot of research. He had four batteries in it. It had a household refrigerator. And so he wanted to dry camp with that household refrigerator that was, he didn't want to use his generator, he wanted it to run off his inverter. So the solar panels had to make enough current to charge the batteries because for 24 hours, and they only run for 8 to 10 depending on the day and, and the weather. So they need, we needed a pretty big amount of, of solar, and we ended up with 680 watts of solar, and that seems to be with us uh, the sweet spot, the minimum to do 24-7 on the uh, the refrigerators. 
What he did do is it, it came with four batteries, and usually we go to eight in a situation like that. But he put in, he only wanted to start with four of these lithium ion. And so we tried that, and it just really kind of blew us away that those four lithium ion would carry the, that refrigerator through the night. What we have found out is the benefit is they have a different charge characteristic. But it, what's really interesting, and I, I, I bought a shed, a, a carport, and I was putting it together with my cordless here, the sheet metal and all of that, and I have a, a couple newer uh, lithium ion battery cordless. And so I'm up there on the roof, and they go from 100% output, which is like 12.6 or 7 volts, 12.6, 6 12.6, 0. And so I'm up there putting these screws into the sheet metal, and it just dies. That's the same thing with the bigger units in the RVs. We have great output all the way through. So all four of these lithium-ion batteries were put, putting out 12.7 or so, I think, and they just kept going. At the very end, in the morning, one would fall off, then another would fall off. But about the time that he, the sun came up and the, and the panel started really kicking in, he was just on the very end of it. But it was absolutely pure, clean power all night long. And then the other thing, these, the ZAMP Solar that we sell, their charge controllers are set up and compatible with lithium-ion. Lithium-ion charges at a different rate and, and, and frequency. They, they have a huge amount of current, then about 20 minutes later they shut down for a half hour, and then a huge amount of current, then shut down, and they cycle current. They don't, it is not a constant charge, it's on, off, on, off, but you can really charge them fast. Uh, the solar panels can recover in four to six hours instead of 10 or 12 hours uh, on a normal battery. So it's like we're using the 400 amp hours in a very efficient manner. And so besides being maintenance free and, and there's nothing you do, they, they recover in a unique but very rapid sense and they hold their capacity much better. Uh, this 12 volt flooded cell battery, it's a decent battery, we've had them for a long time. It's an entry level 12 volt deep cycle, it's rated at 80 amp hours. But six months into it, this battery is rated, it's only gonna be about 60 or 70. And after a year or so, it's going to be around 50, and then it starts falling off from there. They don't maintain that 80 amp hour rating very long. It's just the nature of the beast. The AGMs, absorbed glass mat batteries, uh, they're about halfway between. They'll start out at, this one is a 6 volt, it's a 220 amp hours at 6 volts. Two of them put together are 220 amp hours at 12 volts. And, and they carry that through uh, most of their life. And, and near the end of the, on this one, five or six years, they, they're falling down to maybe 180 amp hours, 12 volts for two. But they, they still fall down. These, up until the very end, they're going to be at, this one is, happens to be rated at 100 amp hours, so two of these would be 200 amp hours, 12 volts. Um, these will maintain that, that potential, that capability uh, for their life. Another thing, and uh, one of the techs out here, and he's, he's a real, he's a genius. His name is Zane. He, he's really smart on this. So one day, we took one of these apart. It was a different brand, because we were curious, and all it is, you can take the lids off and you know and kind of look in there, and all they are is printed circuit boards with capacitors and a small PC board that controls the discharge. It says to one capacitor, discharge. Okay, your turn. Your turn. And they just one at a time discharge into a 
you know, a potentiometer that holds that current so it's a very steady. You're really keeping up. I'm impressed. <laughs> Almost looks like she used to make them or sell them. Yeah, I think so. I <laughs> think that was a plan. <laughs> but I'm impressed. My dad owned a service station. <laughs> it helps them. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, it's it's really interesting. And, and one thing that we have learned is the whole point of, of the brand is the quality. And uh, right now we're seeing that the... Uh, uh, the best one is the one made down in California, the, uh, I forgot the name, huh? Did, what was it? It's, uh, it's, not the medic one. No, eh, I'm sorry, I'm a little, don't come up with it in a minute. Anyway, the, the Chinese ones seem to be a, a lot cheaper for the most part, and the difference is Battleborn, thank you, Yes. Um, is the best. And, they have stainless steel frames and their, uh, the, the stacks of capacitors and the little control boards are, are, uh, have stainless steel screws. The, the cheapest plastic one, or the cheapest Chinese one we saw was uh, they had plastic and zip ties in there and you can, you know, they're all over the place. They wouldn't, they, they just didn't look like they were going to last. So what you're paying for between the $600 and the $900, what used to be $1,200 and $1,500, what you're paying for is the quality of the components, the way that they're manufactured, the boards, the fasteners, the, the, the little frames and all of that. The better the quality, the longer they last. Uh, and the, another thing that's really interesting, let's say you've got Let's say you buy a Battleborn, and seven years into it, one of the batteries, uh, the little display on the battery shows that it's got some problems. You can actually take the top off, and it'll tell you which, and it communicates with your smartphone, and it'll tell you which of those little boards is defective. You send it in, they'll send you a new board, you put it back in, now your battery is back to 100%. And you could actually theoretically keep doing this, keep it moving for many, many, many years. And he and I, about a year ago, when we really started looking at this, I was pushing the, the vendor to see how they would, what they would commit to as far as longevity, and they really don't know. Um, I think that uh, most of them are five to seven year warranty. And I think that's what just stuck on the wall. It's just, they, they have no idea really how long these are going to last. They don't get a memory, but eventually anything electronic will crack, fail, something will come apart, and then, but you can replace the components. It's pretty, pretty nice. For those of us that don't have the kind of money to put a thousand, twelve hundred dollars in, each battery and, and put a four to eight battery bank in our coach. The AGM has been the one that we use for many, many, many years, the best one. This Lifeline has been the workhorse for this company for many years. We do a lot of large inverter solar battery kits and this has been the way to go. Absorbed glass mat, for those of you, it is a lead plate <laughs> in a fiberglass pouch that is impregnated with a resin type of electrolyte. It's then sealed, and that's a big deal. You don't need it ventilated. You don't have to add water. You don't have to do anything. Just kind of dust it off once in a while, and you know, seven, eight, ten years later, you know, you still have a good battery. These will get a small memory, and all you do is you do an equalized charge where you crank it up to about 15 volts for a short period of time and then drop it back down. It kind of gets it straight in its head and it starts going again. These have been an excellent battery. These batteries, this is the entry level flooded cell, two to three years. Um, you know, we've seen six volt batteries four or five years, but not too often. They're a high maintenance, but that's, that's what you're going to get. Extremely high maintenance.
Any any questions about any of this stuff? I do a lot of reading on forums and stuff. And uh, I notice a lot of people replacing the 12 volt batteries with 6 volt batteries. Is that just because they're cheaper or is there a reason for that? Or? The, the question is, is he's seeing a lot of people migrate from 12 volt to 6 volt. And here's the answer. This is 80 amp hour, two of them together are 160, and that doesn't last very long. After a year, they may be 50 amp hours apiece. In a flooded cell, 6 volt, there are 220 amp hours at 6 volts each. Two of them are 220 amp hours at 12 volts. And it'll stay above 200 amp hours for two, three, four years. So for a small amount of more money and a little bit more height, you get basically twice the capacity. Uh, you give away a little bit because you have to maintain them a lot more constantly having to add water every three, four, or five weeks, but they still work twice as long, twice the capacity, both. They, they, they work much better. And then, if you have the money and you're tired of me messing with the, the flooded cell, then you go to the AGM. The AGM has the same basic capacity, real-world capacity, as the flooded cells, but they, they're much more stable power they, they don't take any maintenance. They're, they, their longevity is quite a bit better, but they're a lot more money. You had a question. Uh, I'm, so I'm getting ready to, to upgrade or transfer, get rid of my interstates uh -huh. and go to the next step up, maybe. Yeah. You mentioned the different charge rates between the GSM and the, and the lithium. Does that mean I have to get a different battery charge? So his question is, is if he goes from either flooded or uh, AGM to the lithium ion, does he have to change his converter and alternator map? That's a good question, but in your case, no on the converter because the converter that's in your coach is good enough that it can, it can charge the lithium ion. But you still need to buy a charge controller, and they're about 200 bucks. Little, little thing like this, but that's for the alternator. Because what happens, was, was this you that was telling me about this, but when you're charging lithium ion on an alternator, it goes 100% and then boom, it stops. And you have this potential running through the alternator that has to be shunted off somewhere. And the alternators are not designed to be able to shunt that current. So it just it blows up the uh, diode trios because it just all this current and all of a sudden nothing. So these charge controllers can shunt off that current and it, it makes it work a lot better. But as far as the, the, the voltage regulator in the alternator, it's, it does, its parameters are well within the requirements of this battery. But the converter in the coach is good enough to to sequence the lithium charge. Yeah, yeah that for whatever reason, uh, the brand that you use has, uh, it's a smart charger, so it can, it can, it's it can handle that. It's smart. It'll, it'll, it won't overcharge a flooded cell, but it'll also, it knows how to react with, uh, uh, but you still have to buy the charger for the alternator. So yeah, right. either way, yes, you need to do that. Somebody back here, yeah. yeah. I was just kind of similar question, just as far as if you are going to try to move from one of the, one of the like flood cell battery to the lithium ions, are there any other elements of your of your RV that you need to be looking at? Because the solar panels, some are optimized for charging uh, lithium ion, maybe some aren't. Are there other things you need to look at and say, hey, is my system compatible with the lithium ion? Um, the, the, the question is compatibility with the solar panel charge controllers. We sell number one ZAMP, and they are absolutely, they, they have built-in charge controllers, and the new ones also have a bi-directional relay to, to charge the uh, chassis bed. We also use GoPro uh, as a uh, kind of a, a less expensive option. Uh, if you're uh, an entry-level trailer buyer and you don't want to spend your your money on a premium solar, you, we go with GoPro, and GoPro uh, 
can also handle lithium ion. But very interesting about GoPro, we happened to this last fall do side-by-side -side coaches, one with uh, Zamp and one with Gro GoPro. Same day after we did it, we, we backed them out, and for some reason, the two guys were talking. The GoPro uh, was same, pretty much the same size, but it was putting out a third less current. Uh, and I guess what tripped them off is Zane, this guy that's just shit smart, uh, he noticed that the ZAMP was charging. It was a dark day like this, inside lights on. He was getting like five or six amps charge out of this array. And the GoPro was dead. It wouldn't start charging until we backed it out. And then it was about a third, I believe, of what the ZAMP was. So they may be rated at 190 watts per panel, but in the real world, the 180 ZAMP was just beating their pants off when it was outside on a day like this. So we, we, we tend to try to get people to understand that the savings is, is, not, is not a true savings. Similar to the batteries. Yeah. yeah. And it all depends on how you're going to use it. If you don't dry camp, but you like to keep it on the side of your house to store it, the, the less expensive version is probably going to work fine for you. If you like to dry can and for a week, then you're going to want to get the best bang for the buck, and that's get power back into the battery as fast as you can. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with those other systems. They're just they're designed for something else. It's kind of like we were just talking earlier. You can spend nineteen dollars for a pair of shoes. It'll probably be great for doing around the house yard work and just regular stuff. But if you like to jog in the mornings after you get up. Usually most joggers or runners go and they spend that $200 and get that set of shoes that I don't do a lot of running, so I'm okay with a $19 set of shoes. So, so if you've got, a ZAMP, you've got a ZAMP system already on your, on your unit, you're probably okay to, to move on to the lithium ion and everything's going to function pretty there, well. There is there's no probably about it. It is absolutely compatible. Okay. Uh, you can do it with uh, as many or less batteries. Is this a motorized or a tow? It's a tow. So, yeah, you have no care. And depending on the year, also the converters, the newer converters that are coming out, the smart converters, stuff like that, they'll usually have a sticker on them now that say lithium compatible. Okay, so we look for that. Because they're trying to get ahead of the, the lithium markets starting to finally get up there. So before we install them, we will usually look, find your converter, see if it's lithium because the lithium convert the converters can tell it's a lithium battery and they actually amp up and charge heavier okay. these charge at a higher rate so in the service side of it we like them because they're about half or a third the weight yeah, so are, that helps us this is 90 pounds and this is 40 pounds yeah, yeah. so the weight's a big difference um, yeah, we, we've installed quite a few and we haven't had any back, so I'm not, you know, 10 years from now, we'll let us know. Every now and again, something comes out in 10 years from now, we say, boy, I wish that never came out. But these are actually starting to, starting to see a lot of overseas batteries coming in. And I'm not saying they're bad, they're just, they are what they are. And... As a, as, a, as a consumer, I'm in that range where I would probably look at those batteries if I was going to put them in my fifth wheel. I've seen that they're okay for what they are. But if you're a hardcore, if you don't want to mess with a battery and you like to go elk hunting or fishing and don't want to do nothing with your batteries, the best thing to do is get some panels and go with an AGM or a new lithium. AGM, that's what I, I went with AGMs. Yeah. I got tired of checking my water in there and forgetting to look at me. Any other questions on the batteries? Are there any storage requirements for those? Like, like I know for the for flooded cells, like I live in Bend, for example, and so I have to pull my batteries and bring them in in the winter times. Do I need to be doing that with the other options as well? 
God. Well, you, you say you have AGMs? No, no, I have the oh, flooded cells. You have the flooded. And you bring them in for what reason? Just because of the cold? Yep. So they're not charged? Or they're not charged? Well, they're in? charged. I'm pulling them out of my unit for storage in the wintertime. Okay. Because what's the, if your battery is fully charged, what, how cold will they go? When your battery is fully charged, it's sulfuric acid and lead. When it's discharged, it's lead, sulfate, and water. So a fully charged battery with sulfuric acid at that concentration is not going to freeze till about 65 below. So that's why he was asking you if yeah. it was fully charged. Right. If your batteries are fully charged, they pretty much aren't going to freeze in Oregon anyway. So, um, However, if you let them draw down, that's just it. Sometimes it's easier to just take them out. These, obviously, it's printed circuit boards and capacitors. So, you know, they're probably efficient to 100 below, somewhere like that, depending on the quality. So these, you know, they have to be up. Same with these. I mean, they may be a, uh, you know, a gel type of electrolyte, but they still, you know, they still can freeze because it's the same chemical reaction. Yeah, if they're dead, they basically turn to water. And we see a lot of those in trailers. We see a lot of people that winterize their trailers that didn't really check their batteries before they winterized it. And then they let them sit there five months or right. four months. The battery went to five volts. And what happens is all that's fair, it just, it just turns water, freezes, and the next time they plug it in, they start smelling stuff, and they go out and their batteries split. We replace a lot of frozen batteries. Yeah. Any more battery questions? Okay. Now you get to go, you're going to go to your mobile internet, Wi-Fi, Ranger. I can. I'm still trying to figure this out. Because where I live, I don't have internet. So he's trying to get me on Roku and <laughs> something. You guys all know what Roku is? So... If you, if you don't, I'm, most of you are not. But uh, basically, Roku is like, if you have DirecTV and you're sick of them and you're going to go to Direct Dish Network, I'm going to whisper in your ear, try Roku. Because you need internet with Roku. And then uh, you can get, well, everybody's gotten on board. It's, it's, I started out when I had 12 and then 13 different channels. There was Sling and, and Red Box and Blue Box. Now there's Fox, there's uh, Showtime, there's all sorts of stuff. And, and there's a new news thing out because CNN is tanking as far as uh, viewership is, is down to about zero. The few people that are not smart enough to understand what they're doing, you know, there's none left. Anyway, Roku, if you have internet, there. And it's most of it is free. Uh, some of this stuff is a subscription, but most of it's free, and you can watch pretty much the same thing. And, and uh, we we threw the cable box out the window five or six years ago, and we haven't looked back. So anyway, so much for that. Um, highly recommend you look into it. Uh, but anyway, so one of the up and coming things is is. Uh, People are more mobile now, but we are still tied to our banks and the kids and relying on Walmart free Wi-Fi uh, is a bad thing because, well, I've experienced this firsthand. We were down at Sunset Station in, in Las Vegas, actually out in Henderson, and they have free Wi-Fi out there. And I got this alarm on my big hot rod Dell and somebody was trying to access my account and I turned that sucker off so bad I put, took the back out of the laptop just to make sure because uh, I was using their free Wi-Fi and free Wi-Fi it's it's eminently hackable and so um, I had this conversation in a rally we did out here uh, last late fall I think in October it was the uh, Oregon bus nuts and they're all the, uh, the high-end, fancy, uh, you know, million-dollar coaches. Really nice stuff. And they're pretty smart on that. And uh, our Wi-Fi is 
a pretty good Wi-Fi, but it's not totally secure. So if you log into it, you're you're susceptible to invasion. So a lot of the guys were saying that this kind of thing, this uh, regular connect from WineGuard, will give you an option to use existing Wi-Fi, but then you could do it encrypted. And, it, and that's why a lot of these guys have this that live in campgrounds because then you have the option for taking existing Wi-Fi, maybe amplifying it a little bit, but encrypting it. And that's, that's the important part is the encryption. And then you can go to the 4G, the 2.0 4G. And it's a small dome. And it's, it's very similar, but they, they pack it inside. Now, what that one will do is it'll do what this will do as far as uh, uh, reaching out and grabbing Wi-Fi and amplifying it and allowing encryption. But it'll also, if you, you have a choice, you can take the SIM card out of your cell phone or you can buy time through WineGuard for they send you a uh, SIM card, you put it in, and then you buy for your in pay for your internet access through WineGuard. So that was their idea. It didn't work much because people say, well, you know, I got a really good, you know, smartphone. I can just run off of that. So this one came along. You can put their SIM card in there, or you can buy the time and you can create your own Wi-Fi hotspot, so to speak. You communicate right directly to the cell towers. They have a new one out. They're trying to compete with WeBoost, who is who we use most. Uh, if you're interested in uh, mobile internet, WeBoost is what the truckers use. And we have for years been using the Trucker RV kit, which has now changed in the last couple of months. They've split them because of the antenna style. But WeBoost, very, very good. You know, truckers especially, hazmat truckers, need to stay in constant contact with their base. And so they need mobile internet. And WeBoost has been the one to really develop that market, and they do a good job. WineGuard has a new one of these. Um, looks a little bit more like this. It is, pardon me, it's the fourth generation of this. The fourth generation of that is the Connect 4G 4.0 instead of the 2.0. It allows you to use uh, your, lap, your, your, your cell phone, just lay it next to it, just like uh, WeBoost does. It can pick up the signal and the information from your cell phone, so you don't have to put the SIM card in it. And you can use that to create your own uh, connection to the internet. And uh, we've put a few of them on. They seem to be almost as good as the WeBoost, a lot cheaper. This, the really good WineGuard one is $700. Uh, the RV trucker, uh, we've been selling for around $900 from WeBoost. And I still think that's the best one to have. Uh, that's what uh, the, the people that are on the road constantly, that's still the best one out there, and that's the one they like. Yes? Is that W-I boost? How do you spell W-E-B-O-O-S-T. -O -O oh, I was hearing reboost. No, we, W-E. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Um, it takes three to four hours to install them. Uh, the the we boost has a little paddle and it's on about a 12 foot cord. And we install the inside unit. It's just like a small control panel. And then it has this hardwired cord and a little paddle, not much bigger than a regular playing card. And you could lay your phone on it. You could be out, I have a friend that shoots rockets. They go down to, out of Salt Lake, uh, out in the, out the nowhere. And when, he and I were getting into this years ago, he couldn't get signal. And we, we did a few and we kept playing with him. He has a Wii Boost, and he can get four to five bars out there. Because what he, we're doing is we're taking an existing very weak signal, 
and we're boosting it to the max that the FCC will allow, and it, for both directions. So he can communicate, and he has decent speed, and, and he can do his wife by communication with that just fine. Uh, they, they do a, a very good job. Any questions about this stuff? No, this is for mainly boosting Wi-Fi. Do you have something that just boosts cell phones if you don't really use Wi-Fi that much? Or oh, yeah. 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 Um, again, we boost. W-E-B-O-S-T -E yeah. has a, a, a you can, you can do everything or you can just use your cell phone. And they have car signal boosters for your cell phone. And, and it's, it's like a cradle. That plugs into 12 volt. It actually it has an antenna built into the back of it, and it communicates. Uh, and they, yeah, and they're I think three four hundred dollars for them. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of people like to be able to do encrypted, and these are all all the encrypted ones are 100 bit encryption, so they're not going to be uh, broken into by anybody short of the NSA or somebody like that. Nobody else is going to get it. Any more questions on that cool stuff? Because <laughs> I'm still lost. <laughs> I've already told him when it comes time, I'll just have you tell me what I need to buy and then have me have come out and show me how to use it. Yeah. And we do that. We show you how to use this stuff. Yeah, we don't just install it and send it down the road. We do have a bunch of young people here that know it also. Um, I learned most of my stuff from technicians. Oh, yeah. And Believe it or not, we still teach them quite a bit. Because uh, every now and again, we get one in that thinks he knows everything, and we let him know he doesn't. <laughs> and it uh, doesn't take very long. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, backup monitors. How many people have motorhomes here? Total people, even, you can, get, you can have them. And if you're, again, we're going wireless. Uh, we have several sets. We sell some from a, a local company. Uh, Schmucker, Smuckers, right here out of Harrisburg. Uh, we have other brands. The technology's there. We don't have to run wires all over the place. Uh, if you want a backup monitor, it's real simple and easy to get right now. So, uh, definitely what you want to do is go somewhere to sell set and demo what you're going to buy there. Uh, because you can get some, again, some units that aren't quite what they say they're supposed to be. If you have a fifth wheel, and it's a 36 foot long fifth wheel, pulling it behind your truck, a lot of them have a range. They work great on the back of a little trailer, or a smaller motor. But when you get that camera way away from the monitor, you start getting fuzzy and you can lose signal. So what we found with some of the more inexpensive ones are great for smaller units, a 22-foot trailer and a truck. But what happens is they don't tell you that, so when it doesn't work, when you call them and they tell you, well, for $200, we'll send you the range extender for the monitor so that it will pick up on the camera. So just make sure it, it'll tell you for, we have one recent, and I'm not, you buy them wherever you want. This isn't a sales thing, this is just telling you it's out there. But we have one that has a camera here out on top of the front of the building out there. And the camera's there here by these guys. And it's crystal clear. So just, just be cautious on what you're getting with backup cameras. Any questions on backup monitors? Oh, that's more popular than I thought. <laughs> yeah, back there. I was just wondering about power for the camera. Where is it going? The oh, power from a battery? What is it going? A battery. Yeah. A, a lot of the new monitors uh, plug right into the cigarette light. The monitor is okay. The monitor. Yeah. The cameras, you, the cameras go in usually the clearance lights. Yeah. We usually use clearance light power. So the secret is, which we all should be doing anyway if we're in a unit that big or a towable unit, is driving with your clearance lights on anyways. You should have your park lights on. So that, as soon as you turn the park light on, or if it's nighttime, they're on. So as soon as you put it in reverse, it'll pop up, and it'll show you it takes power from the clearance light. So the camera's on. 
and sends it up to your monitor. And they do have options. You can get some of them hardwired, so you know we can mount it permanently. Uh, some of them even you can get now where they go through if your vehicle already has an onboard camera system. Uh, you know we can drop. So there's usually there usually comes an adapter, and usually most of those have uh, an input for a secondary video. I actually had a camera put in my third brake light in my big truck, and the only place it looks is right down at my hitch. So when I'm loading up, I don't have to have my wife in between the fifth wheel of the truck and I'm screaming and hollering. We get mad before we even go camping. We're mad at each other. So, and believe it or not, I think the camera was 42 bucks. That's worth it. And it was all integrated. Yeah, it just went. I paid a guy to put it in because you had to pull the headliner down. But I think it was 150 bucks that we had it put in. And all I do is reach over and hit camera, and it comes on. And it has automatic reverse signal to it. So when I put it in reverse, or it was, I like to call it reverse. My wife lets me know I say it wrong, but reverse when you're down by the creek. So, yeah, there's all sorts of technology out there, and we're willing to help you out with it. You had a question, or Oh, I just, uh, I've got a, the camera's probably five years old uh, on my Navion. Uh, do those, do they replace those uh, Winnebago cameras? They I notice can. it's very fuzzy looking. It's very I don't fuzzy. know if it's dirty. It's I a wired it. system also. Got to get up there and clean it. Probably that would help. Yeah, depending on. I don't how, know how long those Navion cameras last. Well, apparently about five years. If <laughs> yours is fuzzy by now. Believe it or not, 30 years ago when I got into this, we had backup monitors and cameras. The monitor was that big. The camera was that big. But I see a lot of stuff in here 15, 20 years old and it still works great. The newer stuff. I always tell people I don't have an exact time, but I guarantee it'll work right until it doesn't. Right. <laughs> but yes, something like that, we used to have to hardwire. We used to have to go push everything up through the hay pillar in the front, run it through cabinets, down through closets, or underneath along the frame, and fish it up through the back cab. And now you can replace that with a completely wireless system. Yeah. I guess I'm confused with the purpose of a battery. My backup camera shows my towable in the back bumper, or if I'm going to back up, it doesn't show me how far enough. So what's it for? So some some will show you more than others. I guess that's whatever you want. You can you can adjust the, the usually field of you can get a little pitch on them if you want. Right. Uh, a lot of manufacturers put it so you can see your edge because they assume you're going to be towing. Right. But some of them actually you can pitch it out to see what's behind you. Yeah, for backing up, you need to so yeah. Right. It just all depends on the system and the manufacturer yeah. and what you want. And changing lanes, if you turn your turn signal on, it will show you where your blind spots. Yeah, yeah, if, if you have side, if you have side, side, cameras. side cameras, yeah. we can do that too. We can put side cameras on. I think we have systems now. You can put five cameras in. You know that one up in Henderson, or Harrisburg, up there. It's four to six. Four to six cameras. Yeah. So we had a guy that came in with one of those big toters, big 5500 back seat, and, uh, and we put two on the side of his truck. One out the back of the truck, one out the back of the fifth wheel, and one looking at the hitch. And they had a split screen where you could put all five of them on the screen. You need to have one short in front so you see where you're going. So, yeah. <laughs> Spend so much time looking behind you, you forget what's up front. <laughs> but they're good. Hey. You know, they're nice to have. Um, yeah. And the ones with the sound, I never suggest them. No. Because you don't again, want to hear what she's saying anyway. <laughs> again, she's back there screaming, no, your other left. And before you know it, we're at the camp spot, and we've had two fights in the last four hours. So, yeah. She always says, where do you want me to stand to help you back in? And I always tell her, stand right in the passenger seat. <laughs> this spot. We love each other to death, but yeah, there's those times. Any more backup camera questions? Okay, what's the next thing on your list? This is a new list for me. 
bi-directional yeah. chargers. Yep, that's you. Uh, you're gonna no. What <coughs> here's yours? Seventeen. It has 17 a minor. Seventeen Newmar it has a bird in it. It okay. Okay, bi-directional chargers. I'll just give you the quick version, then you can ask questions if you want. Bi-directional charger. Most motor homes, all motor homes, should when you plug them in, charge the back house battery. <coughs> Will not charge the chassis battery. So when you're plugged in, parked somewhere for two weeks or three weeks, the chassis battery is not getting to charge. They do sell what they call bi-directional isolator, relay delay, a bird box, charge regularly. Yeah. There are all sorts of names. They used to be called birds. That's the he knows the ethylene polydimorphic material. Did rubber. I get it right? It's ethylene polydimorphic rubber. Then why is it EPDM? Because rubber M does rubber doesn't start with M. Ethylene. Gotcha, didn't I? No, it's <laughs> ethylene polydimorphic. Morphic. Oh, okay. So it should be EPDMR. <laughs> Let me get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, sorry, we have fun sometimes up here. So what this does is we hook the, the chassis battery and the house battery to this little selector, this little electronic box. And it will read the battery voltage from the chassis and the house. And when you're plugged in, it will decide what if your as soon as your chassis battery gets full or house battery, excuse me, it will basically turn off and run over so it keeps your chassis battery charged up. We get a lot of people that say every two weeks my battery's dead in my chassis. It's not that uncommon. There's a lot of things, even if you have a disconnect switch, there's a lot of stuff on a chassis battery that's wired direct memories and all sorts of stuff. So there is a parasitic draw that can draw stuff down. So if you're one of those people and you go out and your chassis battery is dead all the time, come in and talk to us about a bi-directional relay. They're a couple, two or three hundred dollars and usually take an hour to somewhere between an hour and three to install. So it could be a six, seven hundred dollar visit. However, Sometimes for the pain of having to jump start and do all this with your chassis battery and completing the life of it, it's money well spent. A lot of the new manufacturers are putting them in the motorhomes. Uh, Winnebago has for years. How about Newmar? Newmar, well, the, you have a what? 2019. Yeah, it, sh it should. Yeah, Newmar started and follow, and following one. suit. I forget we're in 20, 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Winnebago's been doing it for years. A lot of the high uh, Monaco, Beaver, Country Coach were doing it. They started years ago. But, uh, yeah, if you don't have one in your Class C or you got a little bit older model, it's good to have. Any questions on bi directional isolator relay delays? You get to talk about your favorite conversation. Happy camper. Now we get to talk about poop. It's in his contract. And I was corrected earlier, I call it happy camper. Apparently somebody around here decided I needed to be taught a lesson. It's happy campers. <laughs> so, and as much as I talk about this, and they're local, well I say local, Medford. They should send us up pizza or donuts or something. But, yeah. So, this is what we use in the shop. We, there's a lot of stuff out there. This is for your toilet and your gray tank. It's a powder. In 30 years, I've never found anything that you could put in your tanks to kill the smell and to help clean your probes as good as this product. They, they started as a septic tank chemical company and then found out it worked so good and so fast that they have launched it into the RV industry. And our service techs, when we have issues with black tank, we have to go in there and clean it out or stick our hands in it or tear it out, cut it in half. Whatever we have to do with that black tank, at no time is that tank clean enough to be wanting to do that. So the first thing you want to do is get the smell out of it. And a guy will go in there, he'll dump a couple scoops down the toilet, 
fill it with water, work on some other stuff, wait about an hour and come back and then he'll drain it and start working on the black tank. Because it will take 99% of the smell out. There are all sorts of cleaners out there that are pretty and they're blue and they're green in color and they say they do all this and when you flush it's supposed to smell like roses. It doesn't. It smells like poop and roses. So, I just can't. Okay. You, you can buy this on the internet, here, wherever you want to buy it. Again, I'm not trying to sell it to you, I'm just trying to tell you it's really worth having. I bought a eight year old in 16 and 17 I bought a 2008 Montana because they built a good unit before the 2008 9 thing happened none of the tanks read right they all read full because of dirty probes and I thought man I've done this my whole life I am not going to climb under this tear the underbelly out drill new holes put in new probes not doing it. I've done this long enough. I can watch my waters. We lived in it for a year and a half in between houses. In a year and a half, every week when I dumped, I put about a scoop and a half more than I needed to of that in there. And over a year, it, sure, a year and a half sounds like a long time. Now you get my age, and it seems like yesterday. In a year and a half, by the time we left that campground, moved into our new, new used house, all my tanks were reading empty when I flushed. So when you have a tank issue problem, you got to get those probes in. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm new to RVing, but I had a 27-foot uh, sailboat. Yeah. And those have macerators on them. And uh, I didn't understand why they put the macerator on the great tank, but not the black tank. And I always thought a macerator was like a blender for poop. It is. Sometimes so why do they put it on the gray tank? Sometimes they'll put it on the gray tank. They do it on gray tanks. Sometimes in class speed little motorhomes look like a van. Yeah. Because believe it or not, the black tank's in front of the axle and the gray tank's behind it. Or the gray tank's in front of it because the kitchen's up front and the bathroom's in the back behind the axle. You'll, when you go back there and put the toes up and you go to dump, the only way to get that gray water to dump up over that axle use a macerator oh, because they're a pump. Right. However, most of the time, they put a macerator in a lot of the motorhomes right out at the dump. So everything coming through sense. gets macerated. Is everybody familiar with a macerator is? It's basically a blender on your... Yeah. It's not for making margaritas. It didn't make any <laughs> sense to put it on a gray tank. Yeah, they, they do that on the gray tanks. Maybe in your sailboat. That gray tank and black tank. There's no gray tank. So, okay. But yeah, they'll, they'll use those not only for to chop stuff up, but just to move the product to a different area. And what's nice about a macerator is, if you need to, a lot of people have a clean out by their house for the plumber, but it's not where you can get to it with the sewer hose. A macerator will actually pump, has pressure. So you can get an extension for those, back your motorhome in the driveway, run the extension over to the clean out, and pump your waste down into your waste to the city. Then you don't have to stop at the neighborhood dump when you're on your way home from camping. Any more questions on poop? I didn't give you the whole run through because it's not a huge crowd. I've got this whole spiel on poop. Sorry that we get a lot of people to come in and spend a lot of money to get their tanks clean and they're sure that something's broke, especially in the first year of warranty. I bought this brand new and might something wrong with my probes. And then we charged them a couple hundred dollars because we went out there and had a guy put this stuff in, shake it around with a forklift, and he did that for two or three hours, and now your probes read right. Warranty company doesn't pay for toilet paper stuck on a probe. So the motorhomes and stuff, are the probes on the outside of the tanks? Some are. Okay. Some are digital now that shoot through. Right. However, they notice they notice depth. I mean they notice the old the old probes went off resistance. 
so they, they could tell when something was touching them. The new one is shoot through the tank. And if you get toilet paper and stuff built up on the inside of the tank, it can also start to, to not read. Another question I saw yeah. on the forums was, is it really necessary to buy RV toilet paper? Okay, just this is a on. big, this is a big one. Oh, yeah. Because, it, sorry, I'm going to steal your thunder. It's the quality of the paper that matters. So, cheap toilet paper is made, it's made like, it's made like particle board. Microfine, but there's all these pieces of, Sawdust wood woven together. It's wood product. Cheap toilet paper, they're a little bigger, so it just shoots it out, and even though it's single ply, it's a heavier, I mean, it just does not break down. So believe it or not, if you get a good quality, not that four ply Charmin that takes one little piece and it's like a quilt, that stuff takes a while to break down too. Get you a good quality double ply or single ply. And the, you use stuff from Costco, you said? Yeah, that's Kirkland Scott's. or Scott's? Yeah. I use Scott's at my house. I thought you said Kirkland. I use Scott's. I use Scott's because where I live, I have a septic tank. And I always use Scott's in my uh, RV. I never have a problem with it. However, this stuff's guaranteed to be microfiber. This stuff falls apart better. It is better to use, but there are, are alternatives. Like I say, don't buy the $12 for four roll that, you know the stuff I'm talking about. That stuff you go to your buddy's house and his wife must buy it because you pull about four sheets off and it even smells good. It's, a, it's just good toilet paper. And yeah, I, I smell a lot is, of toilet paper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a sword. Some of us hate it. Some of us have our thing. <laughs> So, yeah, sometimes it's just the quantity. And when you get that quilted stuff, they've taken good quality toilet paper, pushed it together, so it breaks down a little less. He likes people to take a little happy camper, put it in a jar, put a piece of toilet paper in, and wait and see what it does. That's fine. You can do that. I don't want to sit around and watch toilet paper all day. Apparently, at his house, they got the, you know, I don't know. Maybe the Roku's down. I'm not yeah. sure if it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, just use a good medium gray, good quality paper that's not super thin. However, we do sell camping toilet paper here. So oh, yeah. I like Stella yeah, everybody. Crazy. That's guaranteed. Inside the and it all depends on your maintenance. Because I don't care if you use that stuff. If you don't maintain your tank and use the stuff that's going to break to help break down the paper, then it doesn't matter what you use, it's going to get all over everywhere, it's going to clog up. So. Okay, any more questions? I'm done with that. Why don't you give us a couple words on LED lights, seeing as oh. you went through that. LED, did you have any up here? No, I didn't. Okay, LED, LED lights. <laughs> Still a big deal. Prices are coming way down. Huh? When you uh, park the motor, it's uh, better to not to car for a few days to the sewer line, just to allow it to stay. And after that, open the valve. The okay, question is, if you're camping somewhere for a week, what do you do? When do you hook up to the sewer? You always—that's a good question because we get that in here a lot too. Even though we tell people on a walk through, when you're whatever business you do in that tank. You want to do it, you do not want to open the valve and let the water run out and then do your business in there. We have a lot of people that live in these. So it's a pain to go out every three to six days and dump your tank and rinse it out. But you want to, you want to leave the valve closed, even if you're hooked up in a campground, leave the valve closed, do what you do in there, and the, right before you dump, Go in there and just put your foot on the foot flush and let it fill up another five or ten gallons, however much you can. Because the amount of water is going to give you your pressure. So if you stay somewhere two nights, 
it takes only a third full, it's pretty much heavy waste. So when you pull the dump valve, it's just kind of kind of slurp out like chocolate pudding. Sorry for the graphics, but that's kind of what it is. If you take this chocolate pudding and add 30 more gallons of water to it, you turn it into chocolate milk. Now when you pull it, you're going to have the volume here and the liquidity to bring it out and dump the tank. So let, let it build up or fill it up and never, I don't care, I don't care what anybody tells you, leave the black and gray tank closed until you're ready to dump. Liquidity, is that an actual word? Well, that's a financial term. I can see her. <laughs> hey, this can cost you a lot of money if you get it wrong. Yeah, I can see the correlation between poop and money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hydraulic or electric jacks? Is anybody in here have a tow? I'm going to do LEDs. Oh, I was going to do those next. Oh, okay. Do you have an electric tow jack? If you have a motorhome, electric tow jacks aren't going to matter. The, the we sell a lot of them. A lot of the manufacturers now are putting them on at the factory. We take a lot of our fun away. What they do is they will build the unit, then they will see what what the dealers are selling a lot of. So then in a year or two, then they'll just start putting that on the unit. So then we have to think of new cool stuff to show you during seminars. Okay, LED lights. Very popular. Does anybody here dry camp much? LED lights, the way to go. Get your bulbs. They're, they've come way down in price. You can buy 20 packs. Just don't get the bright whites. Don't, don't, don't buy the bright white and run through the whole fifth floor RV and put in bright whites. Because when you go in there and turn it on, it's too bright. So mix them up a little bit. Get cool white. Get, get a bright white over the kitchen sink, get a cool white where you like to read. Because uh, believe me, in such a, the UV, there was actually, we had a, a lady that came for quite a while, engineered, I don't know if you remember, but she was the LED specialist. She actually worked for a company and she could tell you all about the lumens and the colors and the, the she agreed, don't get bright white, cool white. No heat, very low usage on your batteries. Plus, we're kind of going that way even in our houses now. You can't even mount it. I think I've seen it. You can't that's a bulb for the last eight months. So, it makes it hard to find a bulb to put in your, your hen house because none of them have any heat anymore. So, any questions on LEDs? Okay, we already went over Jack. Oh. You gotta get that hand up. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. Do you know new math? Because I brought my coach two times in. When I pad, the air is flicking. Okay. Some bolts. Some bolts, yeah. Yeah. I brought in to fix. I changed the bulb lights, put a brand new bulb lights, still do the same thing. There are there are like anything, LEDs. In the history of the world, LEDs these are relatively new. Um, we have had some recalls on some LED lights with the manufacturers. You may want to check. You may want to call in or give a Dan. Uh, he has a, what year is it? 2019, Vantana. Did, did, did Newmar have any? Not 19. Do you have a couple that are bad? He has a couple that keep, keep flickering. Yeah, I brought the in. Cindy should take care of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, with with Newmar, absolutely. They, we, we in the past used to buy the new LEDs by a case of 144 because we were, I mean, we're still doing it. Coaches will have 20 or 30 lights and we replace them all. They, they tell us to replace them all. Uh, Winnebago is pretty good about that too. But uh, Newmar, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we may just have, sounds like he's changed the bulb, so we may have to just change the whole light. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah. it's a whole. It's yeah, a whole there was life. there was one manufacturer that bought a bunch out of somewhere across the ocean. I don't like to, you know somewhere besides America, and they must have got a really good deal because there for about a year, I bet you we changed out five thousand ceiling lights. Yeah, 
there was an actual, not just a, hey, these are going to flicker, there was an actual safety concern with them. So, you know, anything like that, that comes out. They've been out long enough now that they've kind of got the kinks out. Every now and again, you'll get one where it flickers, and we just replace the lights now, not the bulbs. But yeah, we, we would replace those, absolutely. Uh, max air covers and vents. Everybody knows about max airs and roof vents. Do you know how on your, uh, on your boat? <laughs> uh, you have to have somewhere you have those cranked up vents. What are going to have the same thing? Well, they have these max air covers are right down here on the wall. Let me grab one in a second. You put that over that cranked up vent. So that if it's raining outside, if you still want some air, there's a lot of places you go. It still rains at 70, 75 degrees. It's a beautiful day, but it's raining. It's a special place to have that is in your restaurant. Because even if it's raining, you still do things in there that you don't want to smell to other places. So they make a max air cover that goes over that. So if it can be raining, you still open your fan. As opposed to the ones that are automatic that close when it's raining and open when it's raining. Right. That's a fantastic fan. This is an actual this is an actual cover that goes over that. Um, they do have the, the the ones that have a little board in there that when a drop of water hits it, it sends a signal for the fan to shut. That's okay, but then the fan won't reopen until that water dries up in about two days. So the best thing to do is just not get the water in your hand. Plus, that fan's never, that auto feature is never going to fail until you're not there that day. That's just the way it works. You'll be gone. We'll have the biggest rainstorm of the year right in your driveway, right in the kitchen. <laughs> so you generally recommend those on most coaches? Yeah, I do. Okay, both kitchen and bathroom? Definitely two. Because what you can do then is uh, sometimes it'll get cute. You have animals that go with you. No. Okay. There's about two quarts of water you're going to put out during the night when you're sleeping in the day. So sometimes you'll see your windows getting fogged up. You can start two fans. You can start one fan going one direction, the other bringing it in, and you'll get this. It, it, it takes the, a lot of the humidity out, freshens the air. Uh, yeah, definitely. We get a lot of people who just want one over the toilet, and I always, it's a very easy sale to explain to them why you want one, either in the bedroom or in a different location. Just I don't get think air our movement. fans go both ways. At least I've not seen them go in. And they just go Even out. if they don't, just with with two Put a up, fan on, yeah. yeah, you'll you'll get movement. The max, the the fantastic fans, and I'm not selling those. I'm just going to bring them up. Fantastic fans will pull so much air that in my fifth wheel, we have one in the far end of the, it's over the dinette, and one in the bedroom. And when, when, I, when I had hair, you would walk up the steps into the back, into the bedroom, and you could fill the pool through, yeah. I didn't know they had trailers back then. <laughs> So, uh, just one comment before your question. Yeah. Um, as much you asked if we believed in it, and, and uh, we're both highly opinionated that you've done this a long time, so my answer is, as much as I don't like slide toppers for what they do to the alignment of a slide room, I believe that these uh, Max Air Covers do an exceptional job for many reasons. It has nothing to do with poop, it's just all yeah. about that they do. They let the coach vent, breathe and vent. Yeah, that, yeah. They're very good. And they attached to the side of the rim of the vent. They don't attach to the roof Ooh. itself, so there's no puncture, no penetration. So the question was, can I install it myself or is that something I should have? Would she let you on the roof? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. 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 With my cell phone in hand. Yeah. <laughs> 911. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's you have to be careful with the fantastic fans. If you're installing it with one of those fantastic fans, there's a lot of control boards and stuff in there. You don't want to So when you're driving drill screws in, in you got to kind of know where. Okay. If not, you're going to drive it right through that fan. 
We were okay up until a couple years ago. Fantastic Fan used to have a lifetime warranty. We would have people come in here and a little motor or a little control board had gone out on a 12-year-old coach that was owned four times before them. And we would walk into the parts department, put that part in that fan, charge you the labor, 20 or 30 bucks, and they would guarantee that part forever. We didn't even have to ask them. We would send that $30 control board back to them and they'd send us another one. They got bought out here a couple of years ago and it's not that way anymore. They, they're still a good product. They just got rid of that. And unfortunately, this is just me personally, so don't, don't, we're on YouTube back there. So don't everybody get upset at me. But I think that's what made Fantastic Fan the number one selling fan in the RV industry for as long as it was. Was that we would tell people, you only owe us 20 bucks because your fan was warranty. And they were like, what? Yeah. So. Hopefully they hear that, and I'm important enough out there that they're just going to change their whole business structure and start <laughs> warranting these again. So, okay, anything more on fans? Uh, he changed this up on me, so I got a cheat sheet over here. Mud flaps. If you have a tow car, they're good to have. Just make sure somebody recommends installs them so they're the right height off the ground. Don't do it yourself. I think the closer you get to the ground, the better. It's not. What it does is it creates a vortex and it actually picks up rocks on your tow boat. The set amount of space you've got to get. Uh, oh, his, I knew that's why you were. His big favorite thing RV covers. RV covers. I'm going to sit down and get my coffee for this. So we have our favorites. This is poop. Mine's RV covers. <laughs> um, I have, uh, I used to have rental houses and I bought a uh, work and play trailer and we sell them up. We used to sell, I don't know if you still sell them. I think we do. Uh, what that is, is it's a bath and a kitchen in the front of the trailer and then the rest of it's a cargo. And I used to, I saw some things and we go from house to house and once in a while we, we, we were out of that business. But I still have the trailer and now it's uh, storage for my wife's junk. So uh, it hasn't moved in six years. It's all blocked up, the wheels can spin. I just, a month or so ago, replaced my cover. So I, I, it was five, five and a half years old, uh, and it was just starting to rot. But when we took it off, uh, it has, they have corset ties in the back and the front. And you undo the corset ties. You want to keep it kind of tight so it doesn't flap around. After, I think, five and a half years, it was pretty rotten. But we took it off and we opened up the trailer. We'd been in there a few times, but I got her outside to look at it. That trailer was dry as a bone. The vents weren't uh, oxidized and eaten by the sun. And the thing was a little dirty, but it, it, worked, it looked really good. You open the doors, the back door, the side door. There's no, no staining, no smell, no mustiness. It was just well preserved. And it really does a good job. There, we can put, a, we put the new one on. The wind wasn't blowing, which is the whole important thing, because the wind will just take them across the state. But once it not, windy out. These things go on, you know, we did it in 15 minutes, and uh, it's just, you can work well together, it's not that big a deal. Uh, they do a good job. It's much better to have one of these than just let it sit out in one of these RV storage places and rot it. Uh, you can put them on wet. Uh, I have it to this side for a reason. Uh, this is that, uh, the, uh, the rain type, and it, it'll breathe. So you can put it on your trailer when it's wet, and a couple days later, uh, it has micro pores in it, so it'll exhale the moisture. It'll actually be nice and dry inside, even though you put it away wet. If you live on the eastern side, or store it over there, where there's a lot of sun, we have the tieback, which is a light gray white. If you put it away wet, three years later it'll still be wet. That's we don't 
promote these over here because they'll they're they're really hard on your RV. Uh, if you're in Arizona, California, absolutely this is because they won't break down in the UV like the gray aqua aqua shirts do. But I I I like to talk about them because we have out here there's I think three really big RV storage facilities and I see all these nice fifty, seventy five hundred and fifty thousand dollar coaches just sitting there rotting. And and this these are not that much money. Uh, we have them on sale year round and we compete penny for penny with Al Qaeda over on uh, in Cobra camping world. Uh, they're, they're well worth a couple hundred bucks if they are. They're very good. Any questions? Nah, nobody cares. That's so the, the breathe uh, that keeps the mold down? So I was, I was looking at building a whole like canopy kind of thing. For yeah, I, I'm just now, if you want to see all the cuts in my head, <laughs> I'm just now building one. But uh, the kick in the pants. Yeah, if you can build a canopy, that's the ultimate way. Yeah, to yeah. Because but, this you have to climb up on and get right. help. And, Right, but uh, I was I heard stories and stuff on the forums about mold and stuff. With these if they have out. the wrong kind, but this kind, and, and five and a half years on my trailer, and yeah, I probably need to wash it, but uh, it was in inside and out. It was dry, and there was no odor for mustiness or any moisture, mildew or anything. We were really impressed, and, and I just. Uh, tires are rotten, but uh, you know I'll deal with that one this time. But uh, and know, I, I can even vouch for them now because I bought a little Volkswagen boat, Southern California, all slung out, got nowhere to put it. So we had a customer traded his unit in. He had a tent trailer. He had one of those, and it was torn. So we were just going to throw it in the garbage. So my Volkswagen sits underneath that. And every time I go out there, it's perfectly dry. Looks good. I shake the leaves off the top every now and again. I take it for a drive, bring it back, put the tent thing underneath it. And they're over top of it. It's great. And to have it for motor home for all kind. Uh, that is that is correct. So I think when you look you... 50 feet now? I'm sorry? I think we look to 50 feet now or uh, 46, I think is where 46. we're at. So, you measure from the very front most, which is going to be your front bumper on a motorhome, to the very back uh, ladder or whatever is the furthest thing in the back. Uh, if it's a trailer, furthest thing in the back up to the front nose of the trailer or front nose of the fifth wheel. And then you add a foot. And so if yours is 27 feet, you, you come in here to get a 28 foot cover and if yours is 28 to, to 30 that's the one you want because by the time you take into consideration uh, what's going on in the front and the rear steps and ladder and bumper and all of that um, you're going to consume a, most of that maybe except for a foot but then they have the corset ties and they really work good and you snug that thing down and you can still get into it and they do a good job but yes we do have Almost all. What about the pointy things on that box that are sticking up? Uh, these these no, are part of the corset next tie down. Next to it, next to it, next to it. Your Wi Fi. Your no, Wi Fi. Your pointy thing. Your connect. up on the top of the oh, RV. That's a good question. Be very careful. <laughs> uh, Usually, what most people do is get a, a bo uh, not a box, but a five gallon bucket oh, or right. something just to. Uh, like that. Congratulations, you got me. Uh, I, I have no idea what, I guess you when be careful, <laughs> put a bucket over, whatever. What, uh, what I've seen people do is either get a bucket or they go to buy Mark and buy a, a small tote, throw the lid away and put the tote over it. There you go. Yes, sir. Do you leave your vents open after you put the cover over? Even if you have a smart, you have a smart. Yeah, you like to have a max there, it doesn't max really. Duck, should you leave your open when you put that cover on? I don't, but then I don't have those covers on. <laughs> so I don't know that. Would uh, you leave them open anyway even if you didn't cover it? I would. Depending on how often you're going to get in there. Yeah, we did just a crack. I, I truly believe, believe it 
are not, they build RVs tight. People don't realize that. They build them tighter than a house. Would you throw a small heater in there in the wintertime? Eh, there's really not any reason to, as long as it's winterized. I've heard people put one of those clamp on light bulbs, 60 watt light bulb in there. I don't mind. Mine's, mine's, like I say, 36 feet long sitting out. But I don't have to even cover it. I just maintain my seals. And, uh, I'm too afraid to get up on the roof of that thing and start dragging the cover across the top. I'll, with the Taylor Lock, I'll fall off that thing. I know it. So I just, no. His wife's down there. Come on, baby. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one of my pet peeves is, and I like to explain this, and this happened to us twice recently. One, we don't, we don't want to talk about that one, but the other one, we had a lady out here that was living in a small class C, and she was having problems. She was in her, she had paid for two months at the campground out here, and she was complaining about that she'd lost power, and, and they got me out here on a Saturday and I went and looked at it, and there's a 30 amp short cord, and then there's another like 10 amp cord, and then another, you know, it was like a lamp cord. And, and I get in there, she had three 1500 watt heaters, and she had like curling iron, and she had a, I mean, there was an electrical outlet or cords and everything everywhere. And what she had done by using all of these 110 space heaters because the coach, it was a brand new coach, probably six months old, but she'd run out of propane and she was too lazy to drive from her campsite to our propane and back. So she was using all these 110 heaters. So I get in there and you could smell the burn electricity. And I, wow, and it was, uh, yeah, really, lady, I mean, there's 15 amps, there's 15 amps, there's 15 amps, there's 8 amps. There. She was consuming 45, 50 amps on a 30 amp service, and she finally melted the transfer switch. That's what failed. And people, you put them in your house, you don't think about it, but those are uh, 180 to 240 amp services. These are 30 to 50 amp services, and they're not designed for heavy long-term loads like these little heaters. So, coaches catch on fire from this, and I just really, yeah, we I don't, don't like, like space heaters. we don't, we don't, yeah. really don't like to encourage space heaters. So, okay, I'll shut up. I just, uh, we've seen some pretty ugly Usually stuff. Usually what we see is, black starting on the receptacles. And when we talk to the customer, we'll say, this is where you plug in your space heater in the winter, isn't it? And they'll be like, well, how did you know? Yeah, I guess yeah. you're melting it. So, anyway. Okay, satellite dishes. Does anybody want to talk about satellite dishes? They're awfully expensive, Molly, you know that. Oh. Yeah, the new technology, you can almost swipe from your phone on the, the new Roku double throwdown on your <laughs> TV. Uh, slide toppers. That's you. Slide toppers. Everybody you know what a slide topper is? Kind of rolling it out inside of your. Uh, I just learned that apparently he doesn't like them. I like them. Uh, I've had them on everything I've owned. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers put them on from the factory now. We used to sell. Thousand a year. Now we sell 200 a year because they were such a big sell to the manufacturer to start putting them on. A lot of people will come in and they'll say, "I have a slide dribble leak. I want you to put a slide cover over and put my leak." That doesn't fix your leak. That just hides it. The chances are, if the wind's blowing sideways, it's not going to fix your leak. They're designed to keep the bird poop. I have to say poop again. The bird poop. World doo doo, nuts, pine needles, everything from getting on the top of your roof. So they're good to have. They're anywhere from 150 to 650 dollars a piece. But I like them. Some units with the Schwinn Tech system 
or catchy enough that if they're installed right, there's not a problem. If they're not installed correctly, 100% correctly, and there are some units that have a narrow slide that is way tall. It's, in a, it's a closet is what it is. I know it's what it's talking about. It's a closet. It has no weight to the top. So we put the spring on there. You push the button. It goes to push out this room. It's real light. And you the bottom light to the top. Well, the bottom starts going out. The top doesn't want to come out because you got this reverse spring tension on the awning. So we've had some difficulty with that. But other than that, uh-oh, he just no, stood I, up. I, I, Here comes the rebuttal. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because you used to not say that. And, and the reason I don't like them is because we get in, more often than not, we get people in with a slide problem, and they got a water leak uh, that comes in at the top of the slide. And, and for this very reason, the slide room usually has one or two rams that attach to the very bottom outside edge of the slide room. So when they come in or go out, all of that energy is on that point and the, the box itself is balanced on these two rams or with this one ram. So when you run that room out, if the slide topper is too tensioned, you won't get a seal across the top and, and, and good part of both sides. And we see that a lot. So. I just want people to understand, and, and he's very good at that. Slide toppers aren't designed, no consideration for keeping water leaks from happening in the slide room. They have nothing to do with it. All they do is keep the top of the box clean so that the debris and the branches and the needles and, and the poop from the... the oh, you stuck one in there. Good for you. <laughs> All of that, that's what they're for. So, yeah, if you if you want to tighten your slide topper so it doesn't go like this, now you're starting to add a problem to your slide room, and that's where it's going to cost you some serious money. Yeah, we see that a lot, too. Slide toppers will droop. If they're long, they will droop enough to catch water. So that when your slide room's out, you got a you got a puddle on the top of your slide room with this. Believe it or not, that's okay. It's normal. When you go to put the room in, it lifts that pump, all the water pours out, and away you go. But then it's normal. Now, when you bring that in after wet weather and rolls up wet, any potential problems with that? Oh yeah, just like main on it, especially in the northwest. I always, what I usually do is, if I go camping and it's wet when I put it away, as soon as we have a little dry day. I open my main awning, slide all the slides out, let it dry, then put it back in. However, when you put it back in, you still have basically a rolled in that's open. So when it rains, water can get in those rolls and work its way in. So yeah, you'll eventually start getting black marks on your awning. I think Randy needs to talk to you. See him right over there? Oh, there he is. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Excuse me. We got technicians, systems. So, okay, so we're down to slide trays. Everybody know what a slide tray is? If you got a big bay on the side in the motor home, you can buy what looks like a silverware pull out door. It's just big. So if you have a if you have a big motor home with a pass through bay where you open the big door, you look through clear underneath. The, raised frame and you can look out the other side. Basically it's just a big roll out drawer with sides on it. They used to be called Joey Beds. Now we have, who's making them now? Leopard, Joey Bed was the big one. Uh, uh, what's that one that Morite? Morite. More right. Basically what, <coughs> what they're good for is if you want to take 25 pieces of coke with you, you can put all your coke in there and you don't have to climb in to get it out. You just open your bay door, roll this tray out, and your coke off. The problem is they take up space. They have to be that far off the floor. They have to be that far from the sides of the door. So you're going to lose probably 20% of all your base storage if you put in a slide. 
not talking you out of it, I'm just saying be prepared. If you have a slider, you're going to lose some storage. They were way big. 30 years ago when I got in this industry, I was probably installing two or three a week. Now, we do five or six a year. Solar panels. Who wants to know about solar panels? Okay. He kind of went over some of it, but he's the solar panel expert. I, I think the, the best thing to say is solar is a very personal thing. It's, there's no one size fits all. Uh, it depends on how you use your coach, uh, how long you dry camp, and what kind of things you want to drive, like curling iron, hair dryer, toaster, coffee pot, microwave, or just laptop and your cell phone. Uh, solar panels are basically just battery chargers. They're free uh, once you get them up on the roof. Uh, people ask about portable solar and there's there's not much difference between portable solar and, and hard mounted solar other than if you talk to the police, the number two item theft item on Craigslist is solar panels. Um, they're a high theft item, but if if the druggie doesn't know they're on the roof, he's not going to crawl up there and, and remove them. But if they're there to be taken, they're going to be gone fast. You got a question? So, so if they're sitting at a campsite or something portable, yeah. portable yeah. they might yeah. disappear while you're gone. That is, they might, yeah, very well might. Yeah. And, and a lot of trailers have a uh, two-pronged plug-in accessory solar panel on the top for that very reason. And uh, you know that's a great thing, but uh, back in in the in the early '90s when we were first playing with these, Arco came out with what they called the Arco 48. It was a, it was half this size right here, 48 watt panel. Now this panel is uh, I think it's a 60. So you're saying on the top sometimes you can just plug them in, and if you want to take it off, just unplug it. For, yeah. for the portables. For the portables. But for the roof mounts, they're a permanent. And this is a roof mount. Um, the Way back in the day, uh, back in the early 90s, you used to have a mount system that would angle this uh, panel so that the angle of incidence of the solar rays would come in at 90 degrees. So it was the most efficient. But since then, solar panels are like when we were in grade school, our science teacher would at one point uh, talk about the coefficient of expansion. He would have a, looks like a butter knife, that had two different metals uh, laminated together and he'd heat it and it would bend. And the reason it would bend is the one metal would expand faster at the same temperature than the other metal. So solar panels have a lattice of rare earth materials that when they're stimulated by the sunlight, it, it, the, the radiation is not necessarily visible because <laughs> most of the energy is not in the visible light spectrum. But when they're stimulating these panels, they, they get an internal resistance that causes a small amount of electrical current. Now, we originally, we, there, there's three primary colors, green, blue, and red. And red is thermal, and it's just not something that we can capture energy from in this environment. But then we would use green, which was fairly easy to do. And then after a few years, they figured, well, after about 15, 20 years, they figured out how to use blue. So um, maybe 10 years ago, solar panels started taking a jump in uh, efficiency because all of a sudden they were able to capture energy from both the blue spectrum and the green spectrum. And so the new stuff, also the grids were changed, the design, so that we would get just as much efficiency out of absorbing at this angle as we would at this angle. And we don't like people getting up on their roof twice a day to aim them. 
And so, you know, we just don't do that anymore in our industry. They're, they're laid a couple inches off the deck. They're flat with the roof, and they, they do a wonderful job. Zamp Solar, uh, their warranty is 25 years. So if you buy a coach and you get the two-foot itis and you now you want a diesel pusher, we can take those panels off and put them in your next coach because it's a lot less money to do that. So would it catch debris sitting on top of your roof around the edges and stuff? Do, do we do catch that? debris? No, um, I really breaks. haven't had a problem with that. It stands up off the roof and they have what's called Z brackets that so attach under raised. here. Uh, matter of fact, you see the holes for the bolt. And they stand off about two to two and a half inches so off the deck air and stuff like because that. there's so much heat. Uh, you can cook breakfast on these in the afternoon. They, they, they'll do a great right. job. Um, so if you did the portable panels, could you plug in? Is there a place to plug them in if you did the portable Well, it, it depends on what on coach. The coach. What, what kind it's of a new mark 2019. Yeah. No. Uh, they want it hardwired, and there is provisions hardwired. for that. Uh, and the other thing is the charge controller, which is really important. These put out just under 20 volts, and the, the voltage is, it's all over the place. It's not a clean power. Okay. And so you have to go from here to a charge controller, which basically it just filters the power, and it regulates it at about 13.4, uh, 13.6, somewhere in there. So it doesn't <coughs> abuse the battery. Okay. So, so Newmar does allow, or there is ways that you can set it up to have plug-in solar panels. They, they intend it to, uh, they, they have the wiring, uh, and you but need good wiring. But they okay. do intend for the charge controller uh, installation and the solar panels. That, you can put portable on anything you want. Okay. What we're trying to tell you is with your unit, you're best to go with roof mounted. Yeah. Yeah. Portable, you have to carry around. It takes room. you got to take it out, fold it out, and plug it, hook it to your batteries, okay. or have us install a plug. A plug. And, you know, for a trailer, hey, a plug-in portable is fine. As long as you're going to sit there and watch it all day. Okay. And when you drive off, put it away. Because the number one thing stolen in the campground is solar panels, followed by generators, followed by coolers. So if you ever want a good generator or solar panels, get on Craigslist. There's tons of them. The problem is they usually have somebody else's last name with, with no provenance. <laughs> yeah. So there are portables, and they work great for what they are. Okay. You know, you have but you're recommending if you're, in, if you're going to have set solar, you're recommending have a for the quality of your or? unit. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's a couple other issues with that. Number one, the kind of panels that we use, uh, 180 watts and 170 watt panels, they're five feet high yeah. and they're two and a half feet wide. So what are you going to do with them? Uh, the other <laughs> thing is, uh, yeah, this is like 60 watts. You can, I used to do a lot of FMCA rallies. They'd send me over there and do what I'm doing here. And the guy that was with uh, uh, Sun Power back then was hooked up with us and he would get a 100 watt panel and flop it down and he'd walk around on it all day long. He'd stand on the panel. But one time he and I were talking, he put his foot like this and he went, they're very brittle. Even though they're durable, they don't like to be flexed and a lot of times people will be shoving it in and there it goes. It's gone. So I don't like portable. Uh, if you're talking a, a big panel and you, you got a two and a half by five foot thing, and it's, it's great. So, what we do, and I go back to the, my finishing thoughts here, these are very personal. If you go for two or three days, well, let's talk batteries because the alternator is going to charge the batteries on the drive there and I'm on the drive back. Now, if you're going to be there a week to two weeks to indefinitely, then now we need a way to charge the batteries when you're out there, and that's solar. So then we want to look at how much current you want, how many amp hours, and then we decide how big a solar array you want. And then we look at maybe more. Solar panels only work during the day. There's not much energy out there at night. So we need to do in, in 8, 10, 12 hours, 24 hours worth of work. 
and then we need to be able to have enough batteries for the cap capacity to carry through that. So when people want solar, through the years I've just kind of gravitated to be the guy at this company. They come down and we, we lay it out, and I give you a price, and I write it down, and I hand it to you, and then you go back to your tech, and I've already emailed it to your service writer, and he knows exactly what you want. So but, not to the point where one size fits all. Yeah, there's no, nothing close not to yet. that. No. But it's, it's not like a four-hour thing. You don't yeah. need your coach. All I need to do is sit with you for a few minutes, and, and we work this out, and I say, okay, these are your options. Where do you want to be? And then I email your service advisor. Yeah. We're done. This town's perfect for the guy that just wants to put it next to his house and just use it just to maintain it while he's in storage. Nothing else. That's a great little maintenance panel. Yeah, that is. Yeah. <coughs> With, uh, I don't know if this is a thing, but uh, you're hooked up on shore power and, and uh, the shore power is charging your house batteries. Is there a modification where you can get your solar panel, panels to charge your chassis battery? And, and if so, how does that compare cost-wise to the, the uh, okay. bi-directional charger? Yeah, you're overthinking it. They, yeah. they do that. Um, ZAMP on their charge controller, the, 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 there's, the, they got the 30, the big 30, and the 60. And the big 30 has a bi-directional bird built into it. So it's got two outputs, one input. So the solar panels come in, and then the number one output goes to the coach batteries, number two output goes to the chassis battery. And, the, uh, and that's when you're directing. But let's say you're plugged into 110. The charge controllers look at the potential of the batteries, and if the converter is putting out 14.6, they're going to say, whoa, we're done here. We're not going to have any part of this game, and it shuts off. Right. So uh, it, there's, if you want something like that, you tell me. We put that big 30 in there, and there's nothing you do. It's all automatic, and it, it, it cares for. And, and that charge controller is like a smart controller. It'll actually float and you know let that battery take, or the battery uh, array take small amount of current and, you know, to absorb as much as they want, and then it'll shut down and it'll also do a bolt. So they're a smart charger. They do a very good job. That's their only job. They do it very well. So you basically just do the bi-direction, you don't do... Yeah, I mean, that, that would take care of it. Do they stand up to the weather like hailstorm? Pine cone falling on them. As long as you go like that. Okay, so about it on the roof, they should be. Back Reason. when I first got into this, I was fascinated with it. And I watched the original video when ARCO was doing the test with the government because the government was the one pushing this. They wanted it for military and railroad yeah. more than anything else for remote power. So they, they did a test of these ARCO 48s. They put it on a galvanized sheet metal roof uh, shed, and then they did all sorts of things to it. They, they did the rain, hail test and all of that with the wind test. When they were done, the only thing left was the solar panels. <laughs> they are very, I mean, the good ones, like the same, they have a very tough frame. And this is glass, and it's all laminated together. Well, it's kind of a plexiglass now. But the only thing you do uh, we have, through the local uh, junior college, we have a little trailer that has a bunch of solar panels and, and batteries and, and uh, power integrators and all of that. And after 10 years, I've, they had me go out and test it a few years ago. And all we ended up doing, we put new batteries in it, but then they, they got the body shop to do a cut and buff because this oxidizes over a period of years. And those panels, we're putting out pretty much what they were rated at. We were, we were quite impressed. They'll last for quite a while. But uh, you know, that's, that's all you need to have to do. Then the solar panels, you can, you can they're charge control. They're, they're, they just charge the batteries. Then you can get a big inverter. We can do a whole house inverter if you only have a little one or no inverter at all. 
and then we can change your batteries depending on what you want. These are, these systems are eminently doable. They just take you know a big credit card. Yeah. Yeah. Anything That's else? That's why we don't we don't want to get on your credit card too much. That's why if you go a lot of places, they're going to say you need four panels and you need this and you need that. You don't. Everybody needs something different. Yep. So I say just for storage. That little panel with a little bitty charge controller, it's great. If you go out every once a year for two days to go on a fishing trip with your kids, dry camping, eh, we can get them a little heavier. If you like to take your rig and never plug in anywhere, then he's going to get into your wallet. Because then he's going to start going for batteries and inverters and solar panels. So don't let somebody say something you don't need. Okay, how about motorhome people? Anybody want to talk about uh, track bars, sway bars, drivability, suspension? Right here. This guy's getting ready to buy a motorhome right now. I already have it, but oh. um, I read a lot about the suspension upgrades, and I had somebody quote me $1,600. Um, I don't know what you guys charge. So you didn't go down to Henderson lineup in Grants Pass where they would get you for 10 grand. No, Great down people. To Franklin. So this is another thing that I really enjoy doing. And and there are several things on a Ford chassis class A or a Ford chassis class C. If you look at your bin, it's one F and then it'll be 63, 64, 65, or 66. Those two numbers tell you what the GVWR is of that chassis. Let's say you've got a F66, and that's a 21,700-pound chassis. It has the same rear sway bar and front sway bar as the F53. The F53 front is a 5 8 and you can go like this with it. It's nothing. The rear one is an inch and a half, but Ford has a problem with the brackets breaking that mount it to the differential. The whole point of these sway bars is they will flex like this as the box tips on the axis. And the sway bars try to hold the frame and the box parallel to the axis, parallel to the road. And the way they lean, that you have to have a big one. So we have gone into Roadmaster aftermarket suspension and the, the front Ford is now a 1 in 5 8 it's a much better steel it has neoprene bushings the neoprene doesn't collapse like the rubber bushings do it stays rigid so that last little bit that you're getting right now that's the neoprene or the rubber bushings slopping around inside the bracket so the neoprene and the bigger uh, bore shape size of the sway bar really make a difference. In the rear one, we add a one and seven eighths behind the axle so that you actually have two of them. But that only takes care of the sway. Now, another problem is in the front steering, there's a lot of noise coming up through the uh, steering wheel, you know, road noise, chucks, chuck holes, ruts, uh, two by fours, whatever. And that causes a lot of uh, steering issues, so they put a safety plus on there, which is a big shock absorber. It was originally designed for school buses, so if you got a blowout, it wouldn't end up in the ditch upside down. And it works so good that the trucking industry now is standard, uh, and it's an option on <coughs> motorhome, and it really works. <coughs> but there's another problem. The spring stacks, especially on the rear. Uh, now Ford has put one of these uh, panhard bars in the front because it was just so out of control. Ford's long front suspension gave it a nice velvet ride, but it was really soft and that front end is just all over the place. And the rear end is the same thing, but they didn't put a panhard bar on it. A panhard bar ties the rear differential to the frame so that that axle can't drift. 
if you take the pan hard bar away and you hold that steering wheel dead straight and the curve in the road, all of a sudden you're going this way or that way because those, axle, those springs are actually flexing and letting that axle drift. So we put the pan hard bars on there, so if you hold it straight down the road, it goes straight down the road. And unfortunately Ford doesn't have them for the rear, so you put a pan hard bar on the rear. So now we've got two sway bars, a pan hard bar, and a safety plus. And that's just around 4500 bucks. But the nice thing is, you get somebody at a dealership that knows what they're doing, and they go for a ride with you, and you point out to them, okay, I don't like this, or I don't like this. And I explain this to people, and they go drive their coach, and they say, oh, okay, this is what it's doing. And they come back and they say, I don't like this because it's doing this. And then I say, okay, we'll do this. And then you can do one at a time. You can, well, my big problem is this, so we fix that. And you come back and you're like, wow, that was good, but I still have this. Or if you're experienced and it's your fifth Ford, uh, Ford chassis, you do them all and you're done. Uh, it's just... The best thing to do is get with him afterwards. Oh, okay. And the suspension upgrades for the sprinters. Everyone, everyone's for the shocks and camera. sumos. And oh, that's right. You have a sprinter. Yeah, shocks, sumos, and the helix. Yeah, the that's sumos. The sprinter up, up yeah. The sumos and the rear sway bar, you're done. Those sumos really work good. The problem with a sprinter is it's not a problem. It's just the unibody. And you have to be... You put the wrong thing on that, you screw up the frame, and you own it. Or it's there as Magnus and Moss Act, and you know, they're on your side. But you have to be very careful about that chassis. Uh, we're one of the few dealers that can actually put a HWH leveling system on that chassis. Uh, they're specifically designed for that chassis. And in your case, those sumo springs are wonderful. And, and that rear track bar does a pretty good job. That's it. You know, Coney makes a good uh, shock and then the front struts. Uh, and if you have a good alignment shot, uh, they can do the front shot, uh, struts, but you won't feel the difference. Uh, the, the shocks, that's not that chassis problem. Uh, the, the, the sumos, absolutely. That, um, yeah, that's a good thing. That, that's where I'd go. Yes. So we have a uh, 19 MR base star, 34 yes, feet. Do. do you recommend chassis upgrade for that? Or, I mean, it seems to drive better with Omar home, but it's new. There's two answers to that. There's the smart ass answer is, well, how much money you got? But the real answer is, well, is it. Does your wife complain about walking back to the kitchen or the bedroom and the back end is all over? Do you complain about, are there issues, I or are you happy? <laughs> well, we haven't driven, we haven't taken it on long trips, that will be soon. We'll let you know in a month, yeah. okay. or two. And, and but just if you notice something that doesn't... I always happen. tell people, are you tired after you drive it four or five hours? Yeah. Okay. If you're comfortable yeah. driving it, you're still comfortable with one hand driving down the freeway, then it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So always now, comments is, if it needed to be done, why didn't they do it to begin with? <laughs> So it's just going to wait five years or yeah. a year or 5,000 miles yeah. and then decide. Yeah. It's just like home construction, though, it's anything. When they do new home construction, I can guarantee you that roofing, that roofing tile they put on the roof is not the most expensive roofing tile out there. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, they need to sell a product, they need to make it work for a certain amount of time. Uh, yeah. My brand new dog, I bought a brand new dog as well, uh, and I thought it was real okay. And a couple of years later, I was like, it just doesn't feel right. When then, spent the money. That's what they explained to me, and he explained to me. And the shop, new shop absorbers, they've got to save money somewhere, so they're going to give you the minimum. They have to, at least like, you know. It's just how everything works. I put on some good shocks on that dock, and I was like, man, I should have did this damn auto. So... The, the, what I want to leave you guys with is the ones that have these issues. Drive it. Now that you know, that you can isolate what is going on. Well, you know, I got this, or I'm all over the road, or, you know, I'm all, you know, whatever your issue is, we can fix it. 
you just have to decide if it's bad enough to want to pay for it. And the sumos are a thousand bucks. The front safety mm -hmm. plus is a thousand bucks. Rear sway bar is twelve hundred. The rear pan hard is nine hundred. You know, it's like almost everything you look at is a thousand bucks. So, well, I want all five. What's that? Five thousand bucks. So now that you know what's going on, you you you, you pay attention to it, and then. You know, if it's a problem, we'll fix it. If it isn't a problem, you know, wave as you walk by. <laughs> I'm good with that. We have more than enough business, you know. But I'm here to help. This is what I do, among everything else. Okay. How about tow bars? Anybody here wanting to tow a tow car? We do. We do. But yeah, we well, we only offer one or two. We got and it's, it's pretty independent also. And everybody... Everybody's right is a little different. Some need to break switches, some don't. So it's, yeah. you come so to see sell. Our big one is. Well, the gas motors it's stay in play. We use Roadmaster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, gas seats. motors is the right. stay in play duo. Uh, and diesels is uh, the Air Force, Air Force one. one. And we and do we those. Find that they, we don't have a lot of issues with them. Yeah. I had a, uh, was wondering. Uh, the, they talk about the uh, kind of tow bars where the car's four wheels are on the ground. Yeah. And then some cars can't do that, so they have a tow bar where the well, it's a tow wheel, dolly. Yeah, the dollies. Yeah. That adds a lot of uh, weight on your hitch, right? Yeah, it's 900 pounds dry, dead weight. There's okay, so an tongue weight, weight couldn't is, is handle on. Dolly. Minimal. It's it's all dead weight. You're dragging yeah, it down the road. The the 500 pitch weight on an Avion wouldn't even handle a dolly. Oh sure. Oh well, it's only yeah. 500. Pounds. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's not going to be. Okay, the, the tow dolly is 800 pounds. Your car weighs, let's say, 3,000. Okay, the tow weight of that tow dolly empty is five pounds, maybe 10. You put that car on there, now you got 15%. That's 4,500 pounds. So your, your tongue weight is now 450 pounds, and you're carrying dead weight, tongue weight, is 500. So you're, you're under that. Barely. Uh, yeah. Navion, you can tow just about anything you want. Uh, tow dollies are the last resort. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was I was, I've been I've been getting ready to interject there. Okay. Yeah, tow dollies. Or you gotta look, find a place to park. We're just and looking at electric bikes for our, our yeah. toads. Uh, yeah. I know what a tow car. Yeah, it's a, it's a so, cheaper way to go by far. I would way I would sell the car I had if it, if I could tow it and buy something I could because oh, yeah. it's that big of a difference. Yeah, the, their tow dollies are not the easiest thing to do, but uh, we do sell them. Uh, again, the tow, you know, I could stand up here and talk for three hours on the different braking systems and different tow bars and that. We can do whatever we want, but we have found Roadmaster is every bit as good as Blue Ox or anything else out there. But if you have a problem five years from now and you drive up to Vancouver, Washington, and you say, I bought this at JC uh, five years ago, and this is, they say, well, for 90 bucks, we'll totally rebuild it. Or they'll say, well, you know, that's our problem. We've had a problem. And they say, give me 20 minutes. And they bring you back to a totally rebuilt tow bar. They get customer service, so we get <laughs> them. Uh, the same with this Demco uh, braking system. There's a lot of them out there. Roadmaster makes five or six pieces of junk. I'm sorry, love you old man, but uh, they don't have a good tow, tow brake. We pick what we, I'll probably get in trouble for that. But that's all right. Anyway, this, this company has a really good product. It's actually cheaper than the competition. But uh, yeah, we just, they just do a much better job for what they have. Which company is that? Uh, the the stand plate duo, or is that what you asked me? What company? What company is a good tow? Demco? Is that what you're talking about? Is a good right. Demco is bought good? the right to manufacture the, uh, the SMI Corporation. is the one that designed and built it for a year. 
then the old man retired and he sold out to Demco. And now they they have their name on them, but it's still the uh, same stuff. And you're saying it's a good quality, or there, there's, there's better out there? There is nothing better in our minds because of the reliability. And, and then you get into how they work. Uh, the, the Roadmaster has one that's kind of similar, but it has issues. This one, it has a little controller box, and turn it on, turn it off. And the whole thing is just well-engineered, well-balanced, well-built product, and it works really well. So is it an inertia one that goes in the car, or is it attached? Is there a control well, unit on the frame? These are both. Um, okay. The Air Force One diesel is, is the only product that Freightliner and Spartan endorse. They don't want anything else on their chassis. And it's pretty much the same for the stay and play dual. We don't contaminate the brake line like other brands do. They put a proportioning valve in the brake line. Or some diesels, they actually take the auxiliary port out of the air uh, canister on the brakes in, in the diesel motorhome and they put a little airline out of that and if that line gets yanked it dumps all the air and then you're not moving you're not going anywhere and it's it's skirting the laws so there's other brakes out there that have flaws these really just do a really good job there. and again they're kind of personal so come and sit down we kind of go over this and it doesn't take five minutes. And I, one of the things is people a lot of times don't realize whether their car is towable as is or not. And we used to do boob pumps and things like that. We don't do them at all anymore. Dave's right, dude. You need to go up to Chevy and buy a new car. Because yeah. Or Ford or Dodge, whatever you prefer. Yeah, I'm just saying. We, no, I love them are towable. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry? Not all cars are towable. No, most cars are not. not yeah. right. and, and the reason is, it's, I'm, I'm techie. So you have the output shaft to the transmission, and you tow the car, and that drive line turns. Okay, the tail shaft of the transmission is spinning inside the transmission, but a lot of them don't have a pickup oiler that splashes oil on, on that rear output bearing. They only have a pump that is driven off the input shaft at the front of the transmission. So Toyotas, I love Toyotas, but they do not lubricate, manually lubricate their output shafts. So you can't tow them. And, and it, it, it's nothing worse. Saturn. <laughs> when Saturn come on board, they kind of crushed the RV world with, the Jeep was the big one for years. And then all of a sudden, Saturn would come on the market, and they were towable, and they were really good price, and they had a really good name. And for I don't know how many years, just about every tow car you saw was a Saturn. Yeah. And it actually dipped into Jeep's sales yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. And then Saturn went out, and now it's getting harder and harder. Yes. Less yeah. choices. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a few out there, but, uh, you know, the, the way we, and I, 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 the service writers are my responsibility, and I teach them, when you have a customer come in and say, I have this vehicle, Ford Focus, go online, Google Ford Focus 2019 owner's manual, go down to recreational tolling, that owner's manual is the gospel. It will tell you in no uncertain terms what is towable, what is not towable, what to do, what fuse to pull, what to do here, how to do it. Once we get past that, if the car is towable, you just have to decide how much money you want to spend. You know, because uh, it, it's the best two tow bars on the market. The, the, the price difference between the tow bars, including the base plate and the cables and the wiring and the labor net, the difference is 30 bucks. So you pick which one you think looks set here or whatever, and then you decide whether you want a braking system. If you're going to go to California and Washington, either you have a big ticket or you have a braking system because they will, the last few times we went through, they, they asked. And if you have a breakaway, they kind of, okay, they know what that's for going. Then they, 
California, as I heard a guy called me about a year ago, it was 800 bucks. His buddy oh, wow. was a day ahead of him, got an $800 ticket. He says, how fast can you get me? Yeah. So, but, you know, we can sit down and talk about it. Ten minutes later, you'll know exactly what to do, and that's, that's what I'm for. Okay, washer and dryers. Anybody want to know anything about washer and dryers? I'll give you the short version. They're stacked now. And most RV manufacturers are building their units set up for stacked washer dryers. Uh, the Combi unit, Splendi, was kind of the dryer, washer dryer of choice for the last probably 25 years. Uh, they have ducted and non ducted. One unit <coughs> does both, washes and dries. Uh, great unit for doing some socks or one shirt, a couple shirts, maybe a pair of pants. Uh, they're just not. Two people in an RV, you're not going to do enough laundry through that. So they've gone to the stack units, and like I say, most manufacturers now have a closet where you open it up, you put it both in. They work really pretty good. So if you want one, everybody in the world sells them. We sell them. We'd love to put one in for you. Just it's really hard for us. We get a lot of people that come in and say, "I want to wash the dryer in this." So we go in there, and we're like, "Where?" They say right there. Well, if it wasn't designed for it, it's pretty hard for us to do it. In some special cases, if you're willing for us to pull the gray tank out, replumb in fittings, if we can get enough sweep, we can put it somewhere. But it's expensive. Uh, how about inverters? We kind of went through that. The only last thing I have is uh, surge protector. Oh, wow. I'll do this real quick because some of you guys look like you've already fallen asleep. Never. And for the first five or six years that Dave and I did this, this was a locking horns thing. Uh, I don't believe in him, but he finally convinced me. He rolled me over last year. Surge protectors are, let's say you're in Bedford, Oregon, campground there. It's a little bit older. And some guy has a little too much to drink, hits a power pole, and 11,000 volts come flying up the 440 line to the campground. So all of a sudden, you've got 11,000 volts right at your RV. And it comes in the RV, and it goes back through the ground wire in your coach and back feeds through all your appliances and all your motors, and they're toast. So a surge protector, a good one, is rated in joules. And the joules is how much electricity it can absorb before it fries. Because this is a basically a fuse. But it has to hold that 11,000 volts for 7 or 8 nanoseconds while it's melting down. A cheap one made across the ocean somewhere, they won't even put the amount of jewels anywhere in their product literature. And there's other brands that we have over here that you can read, they're 1,250, they're, they're 1,600. This one's almost 3,000. The bigger the jewels, the more electricity that they can hold while it's failing. And you save the box, and if it ever fails, you put it back in the box, you send it back to them. If it's within the warranty, they send you a new one. If it's out of warranty, they rebuild it and send it back to you for a few bucks, if you have a box. The whole point is, if, if you get a good, if you're going to get one, you get the best one that will handle the most uh, amount of jewels, then when it does fail, what little, if anything, gets through is not going to damage it. You have a cheap one, and it's letting the majority of the current through, so you may lose your TV and your microwave and, and maybe your converter. Those are the first three to go. You may lose those three, but um, your toaster's fine. You know, it's, it's, that's how they work. So if you're going to get one, get the best one you can. And for Dave, God love him, so do I. <laughs> If you're, on a, if you're a young guy, you're still working, you got a two-week shot to get to Pennsylvania, 
halfway there, you fry, what do you do? If you have surge protectors, you just keep going on your vacation. If you lose your electrical, you, you either fly home or rent a car and off you go, and you come back two months later, and $10,000 later, if your insurance company pays for most of it, you come back two months later and get your coach and take it home. So the benefit of a surge protector is it's not going to, it's going to keep you from ruining your vacation, that one in a thousand electrical issues. So uh, I, I hand that back to Dave. That he, we only see it four or five times a year in our service department. Yeah. But we're only one service department. That was the question I was getting asked. And usually four or five, usually it's somewhere between five and twelve thousand dollars. And it's not the money. A lot of people are like, hey, whatever it is, we're on my way. My grandmother just died and we gotta be out of here in two days. There's no way I can get you back on the road in two days. Yeah. So do the new coaches like our nineteen new bar have any surge protectors built in or anything? Remember early on he was saying sometimes we wish that new things came out hadn't? Well, in 2019, the new air and the higher end Dutch stars and, and up came out with a transfer switch slash uh, surge protector. And uh, we are now removing those. No base stars. So no, we're they, lowering. We're lowering. We're lowering. <laughs> yeah, they just have a regular American Pie Mom and you know, you know, good yeah. transfer switch. That no, no surge protectors. Yeah. So, uh, and, and you yeah, know that that those surge protect built-in surge protector transfer switches were only on coaches for like maybe six months. We they pulled and they were gone again. Yeah. And they just that wasn't good. Yeah. They tried to build it into their transfer switch as a problem. They, they, rather than just going with known technology, they decided well since we got to hook all the wires here. We'll just build it into this other piece of electronics, and they haven't been able to, to, to marry them yet. Is that mounted, or is that just something you plug in the line in between? There's several types. Yeah. This one here is mounted. That's a hard wire. Yeah. And it's 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 not that it's more of a if you have space, you know. Sometimes we have to put them in a compartment next to them, but this is not that big a deal. This this one's a portable one, and it's on the Craigslist hot list too. Uh, it's not that popular, but it's not like generator solar panels and, yeah. and things like that. I had a question for you. When you first started talking, you kind of pulled out on that Archon box. <coughs> What's that? I said, when you first started talking, you pulled out on that Archon box, and I got the impression that that one wasn't quite the quality that you would look for. Was it's that right not the that? best quality. Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, this there's, one's... It's always, there's always that starting one. Yeah. Uh, my fifth wheel, I have one like that. When I had my little uh, l type trailer I had, it was a little 30 amp, didn't have hardly nothing in it. Yeah. And I bought one of those little plug-in $60, and I thought, you know, if it goes, it goes. If it doesn't, it's not going to hurt anything. So that's kind of the one we, Surge Guard is the one we've been putting in for 10 or 11 years that I know of. Yeah. And we haven't had a lot of issues with it. And what's nice about it is it'll actually give you a readout also. It'll, it'll tell you what, if there's a problem. If you plug in and everything's still working, the stuff will still work even if there's a problem. You'll have uh, open neutrals. Uh, what's this all tell you? Uh, voltage, open neutral, reverse polarity. Or reverse polarities. Uh, and, it, and what it does is it actually will take also a minute when you plug in, it'll take a minute because that actually will go through a testing procedure to make sure it's safe to even plug it in. And if it's not, then it'll just not turn on to save itself from trying. Any more questions? Thank you. A lot of new faces here. Hopefully, we see you next month, second Saturday, for the big 101. That's when uh, Dan gets really crazy. Does that cover more maintenance or is that? A lot of maintenance, a lot of stuff. Okay. That gets right into it. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.